Okay, you were a member of the Bang Bang Club. Can you tell us what it is? Was it Bang Bang shooting? It's it's important to understand that the Bang Bang Club was a myth. It never existed. There was never such a thing as a Bang Bang Club. We were a group of friends who were very dedicated to documenting the end of apartheid and the political violence that ensued after the liberation of Nelson Mandela and the unbanning of political parties. And how the term came about, a uh, magazine, a popular magazine in South Africa, wrote an article about the various photographers that were documenting the violence. And the title of that article was the Bang Bang Paparazzi. And of course, we did not like this. We were very offended. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we spoke to the editor, and, um, and that was the end of it. About a year or two later, he wrote another article, a subsequent article, follow-up, and then he called it the Bang Bang Club. And then it stuck. And then we came to be known as the Bang Bang Club. Mm -hmm. But there was never such a thing as a club. You know, and if you read the, the book, that's very clear in the book. In fact, the title, the original title of the book, when Greg and I were writing the book, Greg Marinovich was the principal author in the book. When we were writing the book, the title of the book was not The Bang Bang Club. It was called The Dead Zone. But, of course, The Bang Bang Club is very sexy, so it stuck. And, um, and if you, people who have seen the movie, in the movie there's all these constant scenes of four photographers together all the time. In reality, it was never like that. It was never, never like that. So it was a myth. But the myth has stuck, and now maybe perhaps the myth has become a reality. But there was no club. You were four photographers uh, covering the events uh, in South Africa, and all of you were in the end injured, some died. Um, is it, uh, was it wise? Well, firstly, we were not four. We were many. The term the Bang Bang Club got attributed to four, but that's not the case. There were hundreds of photographers covering, documenting the end of apartheid. So that's inaccurate. Again, the myth. And yes, out of the group of friends, we had casualties. Greg was shot, but survived. In one incident, he was shot three times, but he survived. In that same incident, Ken was killed. Uh, much later on, Kevin Carter took his own life, a uh, couple of months after winning the Pulitzer Prize. Mm -hmm. And then much later on, Gary Bernard, so now we're five people, <laughs> also took his own life. And um, so, yes, you know, the casualties, yes, which is not to be unexpected. Um, the suicide is always unfortunate and hard, but uh, it's just a testament to the difficulties and the post-traumatic stress that many f journalists, photojournalists, experience uh, while documenting conflict. And um, it's unfortunate, but f since the first camera has gone to war, there have been casualties. And... Um, so yes, it's, it's true. But again, the myth of the Bang Bang Club is a myth. There was many people documenting the violence, many, many people, TV people, print journalists, still photographers. And the so-called group of the Bang Bang Club often was five, six people, you know, yeah. colleagues from overseas, American journalists. You know, we were many, you know, it's a small community and we tend to, you know, gravitate, gravitate towards each other when we share the danger, share the costs, mm. share, share the experience. Mm. Um, but can you get attracted to danger? Because it's something which obviously needs to be recorded. Um, the events need to be recorded. But can you get hooked on it? Um, it's an interesting question. It's a question that people often ask me. And um, there is a certain adrenaline high in, in a combat situation. But, you know, to be perfectly honest, those moments are few and far between. You know, when, you, when you're documenting conflict, when you're documenting war, it's not as if every single time you step out, you are getting shot at. There are periods when it is like that. But for the most part, there's a lot of 
mundane, boring moments. There's a lot of difficult moments, you know, when, you, when you're documenting the suffering of innocent people, when you're seeing um, women, children, being, you know, lives being destroyed because of a, because of a war, because of mm -hmm. decisions made by politicians mm -hmm. and, and madmen. Um, those are very difficult. Mm -hmm. Those are not, there's no adrenaline in that. Mm -hmm. And then there's those moments of just pure boredom where you're spending hours on end just waiting mm -hmm. for a story to develop. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you know, those, those brief moments, those kinetic moments mm -hmm. when there's a lot of, you know, there's, a, there's combat, you mm -hmm. know, one crazy man trying to shoot another crazy man, you know. Yes, there is that mm -hmm. energy, there is that adrenaline. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but you had two men committing suicide, so that's a testament to no, the it, psychological effect. Yes, of course, of course. If it was just adrenaline, look, if, 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 if you're looking for adrenaline buzz, a permanent adrenaline buzz, then a career as a journalist is not the place to go looking for it. Yes, there are moments that it does exist, and those moments are exhilarating. They are, you know. There's nothing that makes you feel more alive than those moments when you've just escaped death. And there's a truth to that. I cannot deny it. But am I an adrenaline junkie? I don't think so. People might describe me that way. But if you are an adrenaline junkie, being a journalist or a photojournalist is not necessarily the place to go look for adrenaline because those moments are very brief and very few in between decades of documentary. You know? and, and, of course... The price tag is high. Mm. You know, there's, there's the, the element of danger where you might be injured. Does it, you know, that's not the case with everyone. There are many great photojournalists who've covered war for decades and have never been injured. Thank God. Mm. But there is that danger. But the, the one thing that will, the price tag you will always pay is the emotional fallout. Mm. You know, there is an emotional price tag to pay. You know, because you're watching the suffering of others. And it's, you know, unless you're a robot... You have to feel, mm. unless because, you know, these, the, the lives you're documenting are not props. You know, I've always maintained, for me f to have a good day in the sense of documenting reality at war, it's very important to keep in perspective that someone is going through their worst day of their lives. When you have a dramatic moment of a mother holding a dead child, whatever the case may be, it's a very strong photograph. But that mother is living her worst nightmare possible. Mm -hmm. And it's very important as, as, as a journalist, as a photojournalist, to keep this into perspective. Yeah. They are not props. They are not there for our benefits so we can make great pictures and win big awards. They're not there. Mm -hmm. In fact, we are privileged to be able to intrude into this world, to be able to document people in the worst possible and sometimes in the best possible moments of their lives. And it's a huge responsibility. Mm -hmm. For us as journalists, it's a huge, huge responsibility, not only to ourselves, not only to the story and to our newspapers, to our employers, but to those very lives that we are documenting. Mm. You lived through the worst moment of your life as well. Um, you were very badly injured. What effect it had on you? What went through your head when you, it happened or when you regained consciousness? Look, when it, when it happened, I was not surprised that it had happened. I knew immediately what had occurred. Immediately. In fact, I tried to take pictures. While I was lying in the ground, I tried to take pictures of my legs. I knew exactly what was going on. When the medics were working on me, I had a cigarette. I called my wife. This is while the medics are taking my body armor off and trying to save my life, because I could see my legs were gone. Yeah. So I was not surprised. Um, too often, I've seen... I've been in situations where people have been unfortunate and I've walked away unscathed. I've been in situations where my very friends have been killed next to me and I have walked away unscathed. So I've always known, I've always known that there was a possibility that one day it would be my turn. So when that day came, I was not surprised. And it was the same going forward through my recovery, two years in hospital, you know, the whole recovery process, I was always very much aware. There was never a moment of, why me, God? No. I knew exactly why. Mm -hmm. It was always my choice. And I'd been very fortunate for very long. So when my time came, as I say, when it happened, the very moment it happened, the minute the soldiers dragged me out of the kill zone, they call it the kill zone, which is the place where the explosion was, and they take you out in case there's a secondary explosion, so they take you to safety, and then immediately the medics descend on you. The first thing I did was to try to take pictures of my legs. I could see my legs were gone. I, I wanted to document the moment. 
So there was no surprise. And then, of course, you know, after asking for a cigarette, because I still smoke them, um, I called my wife because I wanted her to hear it from me, mm -hmm. as opposed to hearing it from somebody else in New York. And perhaps also, in case I was going to die, I didn't think I was going to die. I could see my legs were gone, but I didn't think I was going to die. But in case I was going to die, I wanted to speak to her one last time. So, you know, it was all, all this was clear. I was conscious throughout. I was conscious throughout. The only time I lost consciousness was when they put me in the helicopter. That's where my memory ends. Because mm. the helicopter landed the, the medivac, um, the dust off, as they called, which is a, a medic helicopter. Because I was with the military, so I was in the military system. Um, when they landed and the soldiers then put me, after they stabilized me, tourniquets, they've stopped the bleeding, you know, given me the adrenaline and given me the morphine and everything else. Um, once they put me on the helicopter, that's where my memory ends, my recollection ends there. But according to the medical records, I was conscious and talking all the way to arriving in Kandahar when the doctors first, you know, when I first got to the first military hospital in Kandahar, because I was in a place called Argandab, Ogandob Valley, which is just, you know, just south of Kandahar, mm -hmm. not very far from the city. And uh, the, the military hospital was in an um, airbase in the Kandahar airport, CAF as it's called, Kandahar mm -hmm. Air Force Base. And, um, and according to medical records, I was conscious and talking to the doctors, but I have no recollection of that. My, recoll my last recollection mm -hmm. is when I'm being put in the helicopter mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I'm flying, you know, that's... But this injury put your work on hold for quite a long time. Yes, um, yes. Do you have any regrets that you know no. you actually couldn't work? No, no. Look, I'm working now again. Yeah. You know, I had I had a recovery period which was a total of 20 months in hospital. Uh, I had 40 40 odd surgeries in the first year alone. Uh, a total of 70 odd surgeries in a matter of 20 months. So many many surgeries. Uh, it wasn't the amputations that uh, that were the problem. The problem was I had many internal injuries, and that's what almost killed me. It wasn't wasn't the amputation, the legs being blown off. It was the internal injuries that almost killed me. And um, and you know the recovery period took three years. But after three years, I started slowly getting back to work, and uh, and I'm back at work full time. Of course, I'm not covering conflict anymore. Uh, I've had my time. I, Do you miss it? Uh, yes. Yes, um, I would. Uh, I was not ready to stop. I, I had. I had further plans. I had further ideas. But having said that, I did it for more than two decades, and um, it was a very rich career. And uh, I've had my time. And I would still be doing it now. But the problem is, well, twofold. I cannot run. Mm. You know, I've got good mobility. I can move good enough to do photojournalism, which which I still do. I still do some serious work, but not conflict. Um, but the inability to, to run is, is, a, is a problem, especially if you do get into a combat situation where you have to run. There's no, there's no alternative. Yeah. And then the other thing is, you know, my family went through hell, you know, um, the, especially those 20 months, those first three years, and I don't think I would put them through that again. So for those two reasons, I'm, I've reconciled. I, I'm, I'm okay with the fact that it's now... You know, I've had my time, now it's time to take a new chapter in my life. So what's but, the new chapter? No, I continue to, to uh, you know, I continue to work for the New York Times. I've, I've been with the New York Times for 22 years now. Uh, first as a freelancer, then as a contract, and now I'm staff. Um, and the new chapter is, you know, I do a lot of social documentary, I do a lot of uh, social issues, uh, be it from climate change to corruption to, it's still serious journalism. It's just not, you know, it's just not in a combat zone. So... Um, yeah, it's okay, you know, life's good, I'm alive, you know, that's, that's important, you know, so you, it's, uh, and again, people ask regrets, yeah, I regret things, I regret things I said, I regret a few things that I've done, but in terms of my career path and my choices, no, I made those choices, I got blown up and I got injured because of the choices that I made, not because of somebody else's choices, you know, mm -hmm. uh, yes, I'm, it, you know, some, uh, Taliban did put a landmine in the ground and I stood on the landmine, yes, but, you know, I'm in a war zone. You know, I chose to put myself in that situation. So, you know, if there's if there's anybody to blame, can only be myself. Yeah. You know, I've never laid blame on anybody's. And so it's it, it is what it is. You know, it's the choices you make in life, and you know, and those choices always have consequences. And um, voila. What makes a good photographer, and what makes a good conflict photographer? So, what makes a good conflict photographer? I'm not sure that there's a formula. 
You know, I'm not sure that there's a checklist that you can, you know, go through. You know, there's certain personality traits that will help you. I think you need to be um, somewhat level-headed. I think you need to be able to deal with stress. I think you need to be able to slow things down so that you can actually uh, do your job when things are very chaotic around you, when things are exploding and people are shooting and all that kind of stuff. So that's just practical things. Um, but beyond that, you know, I think the most important thing about choosing to do this kind of work is that you need to have a clear understanding as to why you're doing it. You know, if as we mentioned earlier, if you're doing it for the awards or if you're doing it for the adrenaline buzz, which we have established, those are few and far between, um, I think going forward it could be problematic because... As we, as we mentioned earlier, there's, there's an emotional price tag. So for me, the criteria is clarity. Understand that you're doing it for the right reasons. And if, if you have that kind of understanding and clear balance as to why you're doing it, I think that will take you a long way forward into being successful and also longevity in terms of being able to do it for a number of years. If you're doing it for the wrong reasons, it will come home to haunt you. So... Again, there's no formula. There's various things, including mental clarity as to why you want to do it, and that will help you make those images and be successful in the long term. But, um, you know, there's no school for conflict. You know, nowadays there's all sorts of courses that you can, can go on in terms of understanding potential danger and what, what you should do if you be kidnapped, whatever the case may be, which in my, ca- in my time wasn't the case. You know, the first time I went to a proper war zone, uh, outside of you know the political violence with actually tanks and all that kind of stuff, I wasn't even wearing a body armor. We had no body armor, so I'm come from a different generation. It's become a little bit more sophisticated now. There's also a more support base now in terms of the psychological aspect of it, which in my time was a different different era. You know, cowboys don't cry kind of era. You know, now it's very different. The editors are very aware of the the, the potential trauma and the potential PTSD and the psychological fallout which is important. Um, you, know, I'm, you know, I'm digressing, but you know, these are all multiple factors that play a role in, in, um, in whether a person is a good, can become a good conflict photographer or not. But in terms of an actual formula, I don't think there is such a thing. And again, a lot depends on the individual, that person's temperament, how that person deals with stress, and and but more important psychologically you know and that's why i go back to what i said a few seconds ago in terms of having clarity of mind and a clear understanding as to why you choose to do this mm. you know it's 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 a real life you are dealing with the lives of real people they are not props in a cinema and so that's also very important so and i think beyond the the shooting and the explosions and all that, that you have to have a certain empathy towards your fellow human being. Mm-hmm. Because again, it goes back to what I said earlier, at the end of the day, they are not props. Yeah. They are real lives that are being destroyed because of decisions and actions of mad men, you know, in the form of crazy generals or mad politicians. Mm-hmm. And so, so all those factors together, uh, that balance of, of factors will make you potentially a good conflict photographer. And of course, then you've got to also be a decent photographer, you know. You've got to, you've got to understand your art, you know, uh, because at the end of the day, when you press that shutter, you still have to make pictures that represent the situation. And the better your pictures, the, the more of an emotion you can convey to the viewer, because it's all about creating an emotion in the viewer. You know, you tr- your pictures are supposed to spark an emotion. You know, we all, you know, we all have this... this ideal that you know we could stop change the world and and stop wars through our photography which is which is a beautiful dream but it's not the reality you know i've always maintained if i change one single person's mind with one of my picture i've accomplished something big one single person if i've changed two people even better Mm -hmm. so you know the 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 art the photographic aspect of it is as important as staying calm in in a combat situation so it's a multiple of factors. There is no single formula, in, in, in my humble opinion. So looking back at your life, do you think you have accomplished 
anything, you have changed people's minds, you have informed people about the real situation from the field, from real people who live through the all the problems um, people impose on them? Um, I think I've made a good attempt at it. You know, um, again, we've established that you, one doesn't necessarily change the world. But um, I've certainly worked very hard to try at least educate some people and uh, certainly took enough risks to try and bring the message home to to uh, bring the realities of war to people who are fortunate enough not to live in a war zone people who witness war through the screen of a tv or through the pages of a newspaper mm -hmm. while sitting comfortably in in their chairs um, so so yes, I, I've, I certainly have, I've tried. Um, have I accomplished everything I would like to accomplish? No, but life's not over. We still have time. Um, on the conflict sphere, yes, that, that chapter's over. We move on to other, to other things. Um, you know, um, you never really know how far the ripple effect goes. You know, when, when, when you make pictures and you document a situation you see that you see you get the instant gratification when you see it on the front page of the newspaper or whatever the case may be but you never really know how far the ripple effect goes and um, I found that out the hard way um, when when uh, I was injured and I eventually uh, you know was taken to the states where I recovered during my recovery period I, I received literally thousands of messages from people from all over the world, from far-flung corners, people I'd never heard of, people whose faces I did not know, whose names I'd never recognized. And they would be sending me pic messages saying, you know, you shot this picture at a particular time and this picture changed my life and I am so sorry for what happened to you. And these are strangers. These are people from corners of the world that I had even no understanding that they would even be seeing my work, yeah. you know. So that was a barometer of sorts. That was um, that made me understand how far the message had actually gone. So you know, in that sense, maybe I did change one life, you know. So um, so yeah, you know, I, I I I don't know. It's 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 an interesting. It's it's not over though. Life is not over. So we we will continue.